Come on, put them blessed hands together as we get ready to get started. I say put them blessed hands together as we get ready to get started. Are we ready? Come on, musicians.
that you would let it be nourishment to our body. Good to us and good for us. Bless it. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good evening, Florida General. Good evening, Florida General. We certainly do thank and praise God for all that have gathered here this evening. And we do acknowledge our presider this evening, Dr. Lovett, giving honor to our illustrious leader, the Reverend Dr. Carl Johnson, and the First Lady of our convention, Sister Esther Johnson, Lady Esther Johnson. To our Women's Auxiliary President, Dr. Audrey Austin White. To our keynote speaker this evening, Reverend Darian Tyler. To the Chairman of the Board and my moderator, the Reverend Dr. Alfonso Jackson Sr. and the First Lady of Seaboard, Lady Dewana Jackson. To all of our special guests, and to each and every one of you in your respective places. There is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. And I know they feel the presence of the Lord. During this, our 149th annual session of the Florida General Baptist Convention Solidarity Banquet. So on behalf of the Holy Spirit this evening, the Holy Spirit that's oh so sweet, we welcome you to trust God wholeheartedly. Yes, tonight is another good night, Dr. Evans, to trust God and to experience Jesus. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 admonishes us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Tonight, we welcome you to trust God so that our time of fellowship during this solidarity banquet can be solid as a rock and we shall experience Jesus the rock because according to Matthew 18 and 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. I welcome you tonight to trust God so that our time of fellowship will be sociable and we shall experience Jesus as our companion. Psalms 133 and 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I welcome you to trust God that our time of fellowship tonight will be satisfying and that we shall be satisfied with Jesus alone. Psalms 34 and 8 tells us, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. i got to be honest. I'm just down here trusting God, and so are you. We have trusted God to get us here, to keep us here, and to take us home safely. We have been trusting God during this 149th annual session to give us the divine guidance, strength, and the ability to impact our clergy, to improve the convention, and to involve the Christ from our Sunday night praise up until now. In closing, we welcome you, sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, to stay right here with us filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we will lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. You are all welcome. God bless you. That was certainly Sister Olga Cunningham Williams. 
who gave us that beautiful, wonderful welcome. Now we're going to have our scripture. It's going to be read uh, by the president of our moderators division, um, and that is none other than moderator Eugene Diamond. He's coming. Good evening. Our scripture today is comes from the pen of the maestro David himself. The twenty third Psalm. In it David writes, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anoints my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God bless you. God bless you. There's a reason why during a banquet I wouldn't want to be at the head table because all of you all are feasting and we're working. But I wanted to pause after we have established the fact that the Lord is in this house. We establish it with praise. We establish it with invocation. We establish it with amen, letting us know why we are here. And then finally, certainly, the word of the Lord has been read in our hearing. And after we have acknowledged God's presence, I now want to acknowledge someone who is certainly dear and precious to us all. Uh, I want, amen, just to wave your hand, amen, our, amen, most eminent, amen, amen, previous president, immediate past president of the Florida General Baptist Convention in the person of C.P. Preston. Just wave your hand, Dr. Preston, and his lovely wife. Amen, Sister Preston. Thank God for you. Amen. And then one of the good friends of our convention, all the way from New York. Amen. President, amen, of the Empire State, amen, convention, and also the dean of our National Baptist Congress of Christian Education, Dr. Carl Washington. Amen. And all the way from South Carolina, all the way from South Carolina, amen. The president of the South Carolina Baptist Convention, amen. And the person of Donald Green, amen. Please acknowledge him. At this hour, our president will come, amen, Dr. Carl Johnson, and carry us through this next segment of our program. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment that ran down the head, that ran down the beard, that went down to the skirts of Aaron's garment. The short, this scripture, he simply says, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. May I say graciously that since we have commenced this convention gathering, the Lord has commanded the blessings here in our convention. Eyes have seen it, ears have heard it, and the devil sure enough know it that God's presence is in the Florida General Baptist Convention this week. And I want to say that on the record because I give God glory for that. 
If you love the Lord, amen, you always want the Lord to be with you. You want to feel his presence and you want to know he's moving, amen, in the place where get, we're gathered. So as we continue to gather, we're going to continue to experience the Lord's blessings in this convention. And I'll leave it right there. In a few moments, I'm going to bring up some brethren to come and address you as it relates to why they should become the national president. And I'm just going to prepare you that when they do come, if you are eating, can you stop eating? As a matter of fact, watch the wisdom I'm going to say. Some of y'all, if y'all start eating, if y'all have started eating and have not prayed, Larry Lover got to do a retroactive prayer for you for eating already because you should have not did it if you didn't say your grace. But neither here nor there, those spoons and forks, they can be very distracting when somebody trying to get a message in cross. So if you can honor that for me to give these brethren some level of attention, and that means you have to expedite your salad, do that, but we would not bring out any other food until uh, after the appropriate time. Now let me say this, and I want you to hear me very well. I gave Larry the discretion to honor Dr. Preston. He was excited about that, Dr. Carl Washington and my friend Dr. Green. And uh, by no means I am not acknowledging him. Me and my wife went to speak to him, I mean his wife. And when I saw him, my spirit lit up because I know our past, I know our partnership, and I know the purity of our relationship. So just as Larry acknowledged him, just for presidential privileges, let me once again thank God for Dr. C.P. Preston for being in the house today. Give God praise. In, in the opening of the official program, I acknowledge both of our past presidents, how I'm gleaming from their wisdom and appreciating their very present day love for this convention with me. So I do acknowledge Dr. James Sampson as well. Give him a hand clap of praise as well. Amen. <clears throat> Now let me give you the aim and objective about this segment of the service. When the convention made it known to us that there was gonna be an election in September, uh, these candidates who were aspiring for the office, they hit the ground running, campaigning. I intentionally kept every candidate from Florida because I did not know who was gonna qualify to be the candidate. Nothing wrong with them doing what they was doing that's their aim, that's their objective. But my objective was whenever the ones or one qualified, I was to bring them here at this banquet. Adrian Taylor was supposed to be the messenger who I'm not gonna introduce because I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. Seal's gonna do that. I promise you, this is a special brother. All of this was pictured in my mind. However, when the election commission did what they did, according to them, only one candidate qualified, and it was Boise Kimball. So then it put me in the betwixt, Lord, how am I handle the list? He said, still bring the one that qualified because that's the rule right now. Even though there's agreements out there, your objective was to present the person who qualified or persons that they can give at least a 10 minute presentation why they should be president. And then after this banquet, I was gonna let each one of the candidates go to the room, a person in the room, Thank you for the folks that the pastors can interact with them to ask some personal questions. Because of course, I wanna use wisdom when I endorse someone publicly to not to cause no confusion in the place where I lead. And I've been tactfully doing that. And so Boise Kimball happened to be the only one according to the record that qualified. And I said to you in the board meeting that that was a grievance procedure of others who thought they qualified, but the grievance people say they did not qualify. Hear me good, y'all. I stood up in that meeting with my managerial postal skills and said, if someone still say they qualify and the grievance committee say they don't qualify, you still got a problem. And if that be the case, the next step is arbitration. You have to have an arbitrator or arbitrator's there. Chairman of the board, President of the convention says the arbitrators is the convention. As of now, the convention will make a decision as it relates to how this goes when it comes to these folk who got grievances or to the stellar man who has qualified. I share with President Young, y'all taught Borgia Kimball well. He's only doing what he's been taught by the Godfather. 
That's why he's qualified, and you can't knock that. I've, I, I, I understand that. I've been in his presence. He knows what he's doing. Can't knock that. So that's not saying anything to endorse him or not endorse him. I'm only speaking what's right when it's right. So because we have someone who is running for president, who also has a grievance on the table, Samson is the one who's here. So you're going to get a chance to hear from two personalities why they should be president without downplaying each other, downplaying the process, but upplaying why I'm the man to be able to serve this National Baptist Convention. We're not here to deal with all those issues. We're here to deal with, I'm here because your president invited me. I did invite another candidate. He is moving for his dissertation. He cannot be here. That's not an issue that I need to stand on. I'm just doing what the Lord led me to do. So tonight, in Florida General, you will hear from Boise Kimball. You will hear from Dr. Sampson why they should be the man for the job. And then I shared with, and I know, I know, I know my friend Green. Green loves me, and I love this brother. He know I'm nothing but real. I'm not like I'm with you, but I'm with somebody else. I'm a straight shooter. Who I'm with, I'm with because God is with me. And I told the I told the board meeting, Mr. President, you told us to trust God, and I love you for that. And I'm crazy enough to trust God. But guess what I said to, to the president's people? Can God trust, and I didn't say us, I don't want to indict no pastors, can God trust me? And that's why I stood and said what I said. So I have been given the sacred trust to bring who God told me to bring without being partial, discriminatory, and let God promote the man who's supposed to lead this National Baptist Convention. With that being said, these men have been giving the max 10 minutes to speak, the minimum seven minutes to speak. There are men in authority and unauthority. Larry would keep the time. It will be so embarrassed for one of these smart men to be set down because they don't want to follow the time. They're too wise for that. I've been in both of their presence. And so I love all the candidates, but only one man can do the job. This is why we have these two here tonight. To God be the glory. Will you do me a favor, Florida General? Will you stand and receive my brother beloved, Dr. Boise Kimball, as he come and address us the first 10 minutes? Please do that. Thank you so very much to our president, Carl Johnson and his staff, to the auxiliary leaders, to the membership of the Florida General Baptist State Convention, and to Dr. C.P. Preston, and to Dr. James Sampson. I greet you in the name of him who orders our steps. Ten years ago, I stood in this place where you are tonight. I was running for the presidency of the National Baptist Convention, the youngest candidate that was running. My partner and my vice at large was Dr. James Simpson of the Florida General Baptist State Convention. He was my running mate. And again, thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Sampson, to be my running mate 10 years ago. I am back at Florida General after 10 years. I come back here as the only certified candidate in the National Baptist Convention to run for president. The executive, the board of directors met two weeks ago in Nashville, Tennessee and to hear the report from the election commission 
And they voted 41 to 11 to accept the one name, which was Boise Kimball. I have done everything that the fathers and mothers of this convention has asked me to do. I have served. I have worked. I have given uh, my finance, the church finance. While we were in COVID and 20, the Lord allowed me to raise over a half million dollars that I gave to the National Baptist Convention to keep it afloat. My record is pure. My aim and my goal is pure. They may talk about an arbitrator. We've never had an arbitrator at the National Baptist Convention to decide. The board of directors have always decided on the process of the National Baptist Convention in its candidate. What I believe is what they are doing to me like they did to Dr. Henry Lyons when they did not want him to become the president of this august body that is called the National Baptist Convention, USA Incorporated. I've come from the smallest state, which is Connecticut, born in the state of Alabama. I've come from uh, the smallest church. I've come from the smallest budget. But the First Cavalry Church has one of the biggest hearts that any church could have in the National Baptist Convention. It is not the size of your church that determines your greatness and what God has called you to do. But it is the man that God has called that possessed the spirit that this convention that is called the National Baptist Convention deserves. Brothers and sisters, I've come to Florida General this evening as the only candidate of the National Baptist Convention. Not boasting, not bragging, but I turn in 580 some odd letters 50% of those letters were declined, but I had enough to meet the threshold to be named the only candidate. I want a convention, and I want to see a convention that serves the people, not serve the imperialism of a man or a woman. One convention that is striving to support the entire body. I'm a mission man, asked Bentley Thomas what I've sent to him. Ask Terrence Griffin what we've sent to them. Even as the National Baptist Convention, what we have given to them. This convention was founded in 1895, Montgomery, Alabama. And the mothers and fathers started this convention on mission and evangelism. And my brothers and sisters, to me, mission and evangelism equals Christian education. Our people must be trained. We must go back to what the, we were started on, built on Christian Education will be our foundation of the National Baptist Convention. I will, could tell you more about the, the vision in which God has given me. I've watched six presidents, from J.H. Jackson to Dr. Jerry Young. I know what to do and what not to do. 
I know what the people need in this convention. This, this convention of the national, they need to be loved and not always asking to give for a cause. We must be able to work while it is day. And so, Mr. President, I'm your candidate. There is no other candidate. There will be no other candidate. Florida, Florida, Florida will be blessed in my administration. You will have more than one, two, three, or four, or five seats in the National Baptist Convention. They will know, Florida will know, that you will shine in my administration. God bless you. The Lord keep you. I solicit your support, and I solicit your prayers. Amen. Uh, let me come in. Hear me good now. And if we can ask uh, the service, can the service begin to hold up for a second, please? Can, can we just hold up? Because we have to bless the food, and uh, it's like they're just trying to move. Can, is it blessed? Well, excuse me now. For I know not what I do. I don't want the Lord to strike the leader for the food not being blessed. Uh, let me say this. I am so proud the way you just did what you just did. You didn't clap. You didn't shout. You wouldn't move with no emotions. You were listening with great interest. When you listen, you can discern what's going on. There's nothing wrong with clapping at the end. But it's listening to what's going on. That's very important. Let's stand now and receive our very own. Dr. James Sampson as he come and address us. Come on, give God praise. To the master of the order, Dr. Lovett, and certainly to our most efficient president, Dr. Carl Johnson, and to our special guests, Ten years ago, I was on Dr. Kimball's ticket as the vice president at large. I could have been on the ticket this time. We would guarantee you to win. But although we are friends, we're different as it relates to our vision for the National Baptist Convention. Everybody on this platform tonight, everybody, got their start under James B. Sampson. The moderators, the presidents, got their starts. For 11 strong years, I led this August body. 11 strong years. And my record was impeccable. You think about Florida General Baptist Convention, there's not one person on the ballot that would do for Florida General Baptist that I would do. Let's talk about what happened on Holy Week. Our president called a special meeting on Holy Week knowing that most of the board of directors would be in the Holy Week services. And he committed an unholy act by allowing 41 people to try to determine the future of our convention. Let me share this real quick. When a pope died, they called a conclave of cardinals. They go in a room, they pray, 
and they set a fire. If it's white smoke, they got a pope. If it's black folk, smoke, they keep on going. That's how they determine in Catholicism who's going to be their next leader. We had a conclave in Nashville, Tennessee. But the problem is Baptists don't have conclaves. Can't 41 people determine who's going to be our leader? And I wrote this letter, went around the country, and I said straight up, if the system is flawed, put everybody on the ballot. If it's not flawed, then we have a winner. But the problem is Jerry Young told everybody that the system was flawed, the process is flawed, and the people are flawed. But yet you can trust the outcome. And I told Dr. Young, I adamantly disagree with that foolishness. Now think about it. Our convention is at its lowest point now. And we need somebody who's not been a part of this corrupt system to come in with a fresh vision and a fresh voice. Think about it. We sold Lamar's building. On a Monday for six million dollars. It flipped on the Tuesday for ten million. And nobody said a thing about it. The board of directors and the officers were just numb and quiet. We can do better. We sat there as officers. We've allowed Dr. Young to sell the farm in Michigan, the Foreign Mission Office in Philadelphia, the Morris Building in Tennessee, planning on selling the Freedom Farm in Memphis, and while we're sitting around saying, Rude, President Rude, I'm James B. Sampson. I bring a fresh vision, a clarion voice, and Christian values to our August body. I'm not just running to be running. Let me share this. I'm just going to be transparent. When I came to my president and said, Brother President, I'm running for president, he strongly suggested that I drop out. And I said, Brother President, I would obey you, but God told me to run. And so watch this Florida general. There are those who say, that I didn't have Florida support. Had all the moderators but three supporting me. All of the state convention vice presidents gave me letters. And this week in the hallway, you know what they're saying? They're saying run and run again. Now let me say what Dr. Young has done. Dr. Young has pitted all of us against each other. We don't have five candidates, we have six. Dr. Young still won't time. And I told Dr. Kimber this in the hallway yesterday. If you think that the National Baptist Convention is going to crown you president without a vote, you got another thought coming. What's going to happen in Baltimore is this. We're going to get to Baltimore if it stand. Y'all hear me good. Dr. Young will have a straight up and down vote. One candidate, one candidate only. Vote boy to Kimber up or down. Now his problem is he won't win in that battle because the four other teams won't vote for him and know with Jerry Young. Now here's the kicker. If he's not voted in, we have a constitutional crisis. And then he would come back and say to the board of directors, since we have no candidate, I need you to make me president for a couple more years. That's what it's all about. Y'all know me. I'm a straight shooter. I believe with all my heart that I have the skill set to take our convention to a whole nother level. I'm not mad with anybody. In fact, 
Dr. Green, Dr. Kimber, Dr. Dr. Washington, and all of us, we fellowship all the time. If it was about me having a position or having power, I could have very easily been with Dr. Kimball. But I say this and I close. Florida General, in spite of what you may hear tonight, you all know me. You've been knowing me for 30 years. I've served this present age. And, and the Lord says this, and I'm done. If you be faithful over a few things, I'll make you rule over many. If you look at our record, what we did those 11 years, it will blow your mind. Don't allow the familiarity to call you to look somewhere else. Jesus did say, and in fact, this is the first time since I've been running, I've had an opportunity to have 10 minutes to address us. I've had an opportunity to meet with the pastors, anything like that. But watch this. I made it past the first hurdle. And now, beloved, I solicit your prayers and your support. Thank you, Brother President, for giving me those 10 minutes. May God bless all of the candidates with health, with the miscreant, because at this point, the verdict is still out. And I need y'all to pray for us and our convention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sanford. Amen. My uh, Florida General Baptist family, if you have any sense, you've heard two opposing views. My word to you is, one, don't believe everything you hear. Hear me good now. I'm just speaking true. In God we trust. Everybody else check out. I can come up here and make some statements to say, that wasn't true. That wasn't true. What you said about me. or that. I'm not here for that. I'm only here to let you know that when you vote for who you vote for, make sure the Lord is leading you and not a person is leading you or a promised position is leading you. God want to bless our conventions if he's in charge. And he's in charge of the Florida General Baptist Convention. I shared with the, the team, all the, the board of directors, when I didn't vote for Young, because I was following Samson, my league, because I know no better, to go with Kimbo. Hear me good, y'all. Young's key man fired me from the regional evangelism. When he fired me publicly, I took the low road, but God never fired me. One year later, I became moderator. Sometime later, I became state president. Man can fire you, but if God still got you hired, what's meant for you is meant for you. All I wanted to do for you to hear what's going on, you can hear right now, we have a crisis in our convention. It's never been one candidate. And you heard my brother looked at me straight now. I'm your candidate, God. It was smooth, too. Well, I don't know that until we get to the ultimate game. And, I, and guess what? I told him this. If you're the only one that qualifies, Florida will be behind you. Because I'm not about division. But I don't know that yet. So with that being said, let me say this. People of God, while we probe through this process, if you don't know what to do, pray and please give me your honor to listen to your president to at least give you a Christian godly observation and you make the final decision. That's only the right thing to do. To God be the glory for this very significant moment. At this time, eat all you can, can all you eat. Because we get ready to eat real good with a spiritual presentation. Dr. Lover, what's next on the program? So I think we're going to do it this way. Dr. Seals, are you here, beloved? Can you introduce our messenger for the day? And then after that will be a song. And please, Florida, when Dr. Adrian Taylor, please stand. If you're eating, please, just, if you can, stop it because I want you to hear the message or eat what you got now before you stand. I want to give him that honor. In your hand, Dr. Seals.
Good evening to our state president and the entire Florida General Baptist Convention. I am honored to stand and introduce an extraordinary and energetic young preacher. As a matter of fact, he is the moderator of the Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Association in the city of Gainesville, Florida, Alachua County. He is the prominent and prestigious pastor of the Spring Hill Church in the city of Gainesville, Florida. He is my moderator and he is a very, very capable preacher and man of God. I'm speaking of no one other than the personage of the Reverend A.S. Taylor, pastor of the Spring Hill Church in Gainesville, Florida. Hear ye him. This is real good music ministry. We're ready now. Thank you. 
receive our very own. This hidden jewel, this hidden great man, Dr. Adrian Taylor, let's bring you back to church. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May we, may we pray together. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for your grace that you've shown us today. We thank you for your love that you have bequeathed unto us today. Father, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins, take away our faults, our failures, and our unrighteousness. Create within us clean hearts, O God, and renew right spirits within us. Search our hearts and find if there is any way in us that is not like you, and remove it in the name of Jesus. Father, as we prepare to open your word again today, we pray that you would open our minds and help us to understand. We pray that you would soften our hearts and help us to spiritually receive. We pray, our Father, that you would save those that need to be saved. Sanctify and separate us all today through your holy word. And Lord, all of us have one burden or another, one issue or, or another, one struggle or another. You strengthen us all tonight through your holy word. We pray that our hearts are lifted and our minds are changed to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for this grand convention. Thank you for another time for brothers and sisters to come together, shake glad hands and see one another again. Pray, our Father, that you be here continually with us. These are your servants' prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. You give God praise for all of our servants in worship today and all those that are working. Give, them, give God praise for them. Amen. We thank God for his love and his grace that he has bequeathed unto us today. God really is good, isn't he? His mercy is everlasting and his truth does endure. Throughout all generations. I want to thank God for our president, uh, Dr. Carl Johnson. Can we give God praise for our chieftain? And for his lovely wife and uh, the entire cabinet of leaders that serves along with him. To all of our auxiliary leaders. Uh, to our chairman of the board, Dr. Jackson. And to uh, all of our guests that are here. Uh, God bless you and we praise God for you. I want to pause long enough and recognize the people that the Lord has allowed me and entrusted me the charge to serve since I was 25 years old. Some of the members of the Spring Hill Church are here, and uh, we want to thank God for them. Amen. And also, uh, after 19 or 18 years of serving at the Spring Hill Church, uh, there came an opportunity or came a, a charge rather to serve as moderator of the Jerusalem Association. I am proud to see the members, some of the members of the Jerusalem Association, including one of my vice moderators are here tonight. God bless you all and thank you all so much uh, for being here tonight. Amen. Let's give God praise for them. And uh, thank you to my chief moderator. So uh, when they named me moderator, I said, well, I can't be uh, a moderator of SEALs, so I said, well, he'll be the chief moderator, and I'm just a junior moderator, and uh, I'm grateful for him. Dr. Kimber, uh, God bless you for being here, and to uh, Dr. Sampson, Dr. Uh, Johnson, thank you all so much. Now, I know some are sitting there wondering whether or not I can preach, and uh, let me just tell you, I, I, I really can't, but when I went to the Spring Hill Church, my chairman of deacons met me, and I was, you know, much younger than I am now, much thinner. And he said, well, son, if you can't preach, that's all right. We'll know how to make you a preacher. All right. So all right. if you're wondering whether or not I can preach, no, I can't. But if you make me a preacher tonight, I'll preach for you. All right. now, now, there are some also that are wondering, well, how in the world, uh, Dr. Phil, some might wonder, well, how in the world Taylor got up there? But I'll tell you how. When the president called... He said, he said, now, I, I'm thinking about letting you preach. I said, well, Mr. President, I believe in your vision. I trust your vision. You are doing a great job. And, and in order to support your vision, I'm going to prove my support in that you cannot pay me to preach for you. 
I said, the only thing you can do is give me a handshake and pat on the back. He said, so, you the preacher. <laughs> and, and he said, and if you preach good, I'll give you two handshakes and two pats on the back. So that's how I'm up here tonight. I love the Lord Jesus. And I love his word. Would you join me in his word in the book of Philippians chapter number four? Book of Philippians chapter number four. Philippians chapter number four. I'm grateful to have my musician that traveled down here today to support his pastor. Uh, my music director, I'm grateful for Brother Tommy. Philippians chapter four. We're not going to what would be considered the typical passages that we would venture to in the book of Philippians. Instead, I, I, I have this thing about the closing benedictions and uh, greetings that come in the letters, uh, the epistles of the New Testament. So I want to look tonight in Philippians chapter 4, verses 20 through 23. When you have found it, the word of God reads in Philippians chapter 4, verses 20, and 20 through 23. Yes, now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you chiefly, they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. I want to talk tonight, or want us to just reason tonight from the thought, uh, for the next 25 minutes, uh, encouragement for the saints. Encouragement. For the saints. Uh, in Buffalo, or excuse me, in uh, Denver, Colorado, the uh, Denver Buffaloes, the, uh, or rather the Colorado Buffalo team, is now made great fame of because they picked up a new coach by the name of Dion Sanders. The world is cheering and speaking about this team. But a news crew went to that area and went to the area of the school and interviewed two sisters that were in their 90s that were alum of the university. And they were noted for their great love of their football team. They, would, they had season tickets for the last 70 years. And in rain, shine, even in the snow, they would sit there and cheer for the team. Now what was remarkable about it was that up until recently, the team had a losing record. And nobody cheered for the team. But these two ladies faithfully every year were there in the stands cheering for the team. When they were asked the question, why do you keep cheering for a losing team? Their response was, we never wanted our boys to go on the field and not know that somebody was rooting for them. Tonight, brothers and sisters, I want us to note that it doesn't matter who you are, we all need some encouragement at some point or another. The fact about it is, as we serve the Lord, there comes hills and valleys, there comes peaks and, and uh, troughs, but all of us at some point need some encouragement along the journey. Doesn't matter how big your church is or how small it is, it doesn't matter how much money you raised on Sunday, how much you didn't raise on Sunday, the fact is we all need some encouragement at some point or another. At some point, we all wonder, what are we doing and how are we doing it well enough and should we even continue? But thanks be to God, there comes along those that will give us some encouragement on the journey. Y'all say amen there. I remember so sweetly a few years ago, God called home one of my encouragers in the ministry. I had been serving at the Spring Hill Church more than a decade and there came a, a moment in the ministry where uh, I had a few that uh, were not encouragers, they were more discouragers. 
But God sent me a sweet soul by the name of Reverend Jake Davis, a retired pastor whose father, Reverend Tony Davis, pastored that church in the 50s and 60s. Davis came at a time when I needed him. A senior and seasoned pastor would sit there every week in Bible class and on Sunday morning and would never leave without walking up to me and without sharing with me how much he loved me. Would never leave without saying, Pastor, thank you for teaching us the word. Would never leave without saying, I learned something today that even though I'm old, I'm still learning and I thank you for teaching me. I tell you what, when he closed his eyes and folded tent and moved upstairs, it hurt because I lost my cheerleader. Because I knew I had somebody that would encourage me along the way. Thank God for those encouragers that we've all had in our lives. As we drop in on the text, we are dropping in on a text that is written to the believers in Philippi. It's a group that has been established during Paul's second missionary journey as he is now in that particular time. He touched down first and established his first church on European shores. He writes to a group of people that are from a province that is a small place, but yet it is a significant place because it's a place where God has moved in a powerful way. He's moved amongst Gentile people to establish the grace of God in their lives. He's, he's, he's there in a small city, but a small city with a small church, but they have a great faith. Can I tell you that it doesn't matter how small you may think you are, as long as you've got great faith, God can do something with you. Amen ought to go right there. Paul writes to this group of people that are faithful in their service to God. They are faithful in their work for God. And Paul writes to them in order to thank them for a love gift that they've sent to him. Despite their poverty, they are rich in generosity. Despite their lack, they have uh, their lack financially, they have no lack of love for the apostle. And so they don't use as an excuse what they don't have. They say whatever we do have, we'll give it for the work of the ministry. Now God bless those that don't mind serving the Lord and giving what they have for the master's service. And so in this letter, you don't find a letter that works to correct doctrinal error, but what you find is a letter that works to celebrate the faith in the church of the living God. You find a letter that works to encourage people that have encouraged Paul, and he writes to them to tell them thank you for what they've done. The writer of this particular text is an assigned apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has been specifically called and assigned to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. The reason he's been assigned was because the others were steeped in their Jewish tradition. And they couldn't quite get past this issue of meat. They, uh, Peter tried to do it a little bit, but he, he still couldn't get past the fact that when he went to Gentile regions, they were still eating pork chops and still eating pig feet every now and then. And I... I'm here to tell you, I'm, I, I'm glad that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like Paul, uh, Peter because if not, then matter of fact, every Friday, everybody knows I'm going to eat barbecue no matter what. The reason I could have never been, uh, the reason I never could have been a Muslim is because I'm going to have some pork chops every now and then. I'm going to eat some bacon every now and then. Y'all say amen then. And so, and so, and so, and so here Paul, Paul, Paul is an assigned apostle that is writing to the people, but I want you to know this, he is an appointed apostle and a right apostle that has been appointed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I pray that I am among Baptists because I still believe in what the book says. And I know, I know some of you have been hanging out with your friends at these hole-in-the-wall churches and... You know, they, everybody's an apostle now, but I got a problem because I've been reading the book a little too much. And I saw in Matthew chapter number 10, I believe it is, he said, and these are the 12 apostles. Are y'all with me here? And the reason he called 12 was because he had 12 disciples that became the 12 apostles who were appointed to carry out the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason the number is 12 is also because there's 12 tribes in Israel. The reason there's 12 is because John said, I looked and I saw the city coming down from the throne of God. 
And it was a city that had 12 foundations. And in the 12 foundation, there were 12 precious stones. And sitting on the 12 foundations with the 12 precious stones, I saw 12 gates. I saw three gates in the east. I saw three gates in the west. I saw three gates in the north. And I saw three gates in the south. I saw 12 gates to the city. Now the reason there were 12 gates is because John said, I looked again and I saw a number 144,000 going into the 12 gates of the city. Now you tell that Jehovah Witness the next time they show up at your house, the reason that number is 144,000 is because it represents 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar. Have I got a witness here? It's 12,000 for the 12 nations of Israel. But then that number is not belonging to me and you, but that's all right. Don't worry, because John said, I looked and I saw another number. I saw a number that no man, I wish I had a witness here. I, I know your cousin June Bug said he's an apostle, but the problem is, in order to be an apostle, you got to go to Acts chapter number one. When they called the council together, they said, we need to find one that has walked with us since the days of John the Baptist. And that meant you had to be a Jewish male, you had to be at least 30 years old, but they said, we need one that has seen the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of you got friends that call themselves apostles, but the problem I have is they ain't seen the resurrected Jesus. As a matter of fact, some of them ain't even got, got a passport, so I know they ain't been to Jerusalem. And, and so Paul writes as an, as an appointed and assigned apostle to encourage this Gentile church. I got three things. I got three things I want to I wanna encourage you with from the text. President Diamond, I, I, I got three things. I got three things I want to show you. And take. Number one is, number one, we are encouraged by giving glory to the Savior. In, in verse number 20, he said, Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Now the reason he said now unto God is because he's speaking to people that are in a city that have other deities on display. You see, it's a Gentile place and they have a God just about for everything. They've got different gods and deities made for different things. And he said, now, I, I've got to write this letter to you, but I want to leave you in the hands of somebody that can take care of you. You see, when he gives them this doxology, he said, I want to be clear about who we're going to give glory to. We're, we're not giving glory to that pagan god that has a statue out in the streets because he's got hands, but he can't pick you up. We're not giving praise and glory to that pagan God that you see down the other road that has eyes because he's got eyes but he can't see. We're not giving glory to that other pagan God that you have that, 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 that's over there that got feet but he can't step into your situation. But we're giving glory to the God that has sovereignty over all things. You see that name for God that he used means somebody that is sovereign and that's got all power. And friend, that's the reason I'm a Christian is because I need a God that I don't need to pick up and put on a shelf, but I need a God that when I fall down, he can pick me up. I, I don't need no God that got eyes that can't see. I need a God that David said, whether I go to the highest of the heights or whether I go to the lowest of the low, where can I go that you are not there? For you know my down sitting and my uprising. I need a God that sits high and looks low and knows all of my concerns and knows all of my condition. He said, now unto God, but not just unto God, but notice what he said. Are y'all praying with me here tonight? He said, now unto God, and our father now the reason the reason he does that is because he he's showing the realness of god he's showing the reality of god but but he's also showing relationship with god you see he didn't just leave it off and say now unto god be glory he said now unto god and our father 
the reason President Johnson, he said, and our father is because he wants them to know that they have a privileged relationship that others don't have. You remember John said uh, uh, he came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to be called the sons of God. You see, when we have relationship with God, relationship affords us some benefits that strangers don't have. He said, you are Gentiles, but you had a relationship with God. It's, it's strange to them because they are used to Greek philosophy and Greek mythology. And in Greek philosophy and in Greek mythology, uh, gods were disconnected and distant from their subject people. But here Paul said, you got a relationship with your God that you can call him when you need him. And you know that he has obligated himself because he's a father to protect you. You know that because he's your father, he's obligated himself to provide for you. You know that because he's your father, he has obligated himself uh, in order to, to present you and to give you things that you can't do for yourself. Let me explain it this way. Everybody that knows me knows that I have a precious daughter that I absolutely adore. She is the apple of my eye and the darling of my heart. She's 10 years old and, 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 and I remember well when she was about 5 years old. She walked up to me and she said, hey, daddy, I need some money. I said, okay, no problem. My baby wants some money. Here it is, baby. Here's some money because you're my baby and anything my baby needs, my baby gets. I gave her some money, but she, she immediately stopped, didn't about face, came back. She said, my mommy needs some money too. Dr. Holmes, I said, wait a minute. I said, wait, your mama's standing right there. She didn't ask me for nothing. She said, that's all right, daddy. She needs some. Give me some. I gave her some, and she walked up to mama. She said, here, mama, and winked her eye. You know what that showed? It showed this, that because she's my baby, because I'm her daddy, whatever she needs, I'll give it. And because of who she is, other people will be blessed just because she's my baby. Can I tell you this? Paul is saying that we're blessed beyond measure because we can call him our father. That's why I'm glad about it tonight that I can call him when I need him and I know he is always near. That's why I don't sing the hymn, uh, 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 Father, uh, uh, we don't sing the hymn, God, we stretch our hand to thee. We say, Father, I stretch. Are y'all going to pray tonight? Am I among Baptists here tonight? My hand to thee, no other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, oh, whether shall I go? Notice here in the text, he said, now unto God and our Father. Notice here, he said, be glory. Now, now, now that word glory means to take joy in. It, it, means, it means to be happy and satisfied in. Now, the reason it's strange is because you need to understand the occasion of the writing. The writing is not given while Paul is in a good place. Actually, it's what we call a prison epistle. Paul is in prison at this point. And the Philippian believers have sent him a love gift while he's in prison prison in order to let him know that they had not forgotten about him and when they receive the letter back they're not expecting nor anticipating what they receive on the other end some of you got some cousins still in prison and still locked up in jail or, and when they call you know you you kind of waiting on it they, they tell you how they got good religion they tell you how they're going to turn their life around. They tell you how things are going to be different now. And they say, oh, by the way, can you put something on my books? But, but Dr. Green, listen, listen, listen. Paul doesn't say what he needs. Paul said, I've got joy right where I am. Paul said, I'm going to give God glory right where I am. Now imagine the mentality of the recipients on the other end. They're praying for Paul, worried about Paul, thinking that Paul is in trouble. And Paul said, I'm all right giving God glory. They're thinking that Paul is downtrodden, but Paul said, no, I'm all right. I'll give God glory. They are thinking that Paul is hurt in his heart, but Paul said, no, I give God glory because he is God my father. But now watch it. 
He said, give him glory forever and ever. Now, I could have taken the first forever. But when we have that other and forever, it gives me a, 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 a brain headache to think about exactly what happens there in the Greek. Now, now I'm no Greek scholar. I, I must admit, I made a C barely in New Testament Greek. Dr. Simeon Martin, uh, uh, Dr. Bland remembers Dr. Simeon Martin. He took joy in giving out bad grades in Greek class. I, I mean, when we took a test, he wanted to make sure every jot and tittle was right. And if you had an accent mark off, he marked off your paper. And one day he said, he said, God said, Jesus said, before one jot or tittle of my word shall fail, heaven and earth shall pass away. And I thought to myself, I wish you'd pass away. <laughs> I'm no Greek scholar, but I know this in the Greek that what happens when he said forever and ever, that what he's saying is, is that you ought to give God glory continuously and constantly. But at the point that you think you've given him enough glory, give him a little bit more. And can I tell you this? It's all right. Many of us will give God glory when times are well. We'll shout and say glory. Many of us will say glory when the cupboards are full, when the bank account is looking strong, when the car is acting right, when the children are behaving, when the marital vows are intact. We'll, we'll give God glory then. But Paul is saying you need to give God glory even in the inconvenient time when it doesn't make sense. The reality is when you really learn how to give God glory, it doesn't matter your circumstance. You understand the consistency of his greatness and the consistency of who God is Dick dictates the fact that he still deserves glory. When I don't have a time, glory. When I do have money, glory. When I'm well, glory. When I'm sick in my body, glory. Is there anybody here that has learned how to give God glory, not just in the good times, but even in the moments when it doesn't seem sensible, in the moments when it doesn't seem like it's right, in the moments when you maybe don't feel like it, but you understand that he's still deserving of the glory. He said, glory! Well, not only do we give glory to the Savior, then number two, he said, you get greetings from the saints. He said, salute every saint. In Christ Jesus, the brethren which are with me greet you. One of the peculiar things that you note when you don't read the Bible too fast is that in every one of the epistles, he always talks about the group that are gathered with him that give greetings to the other group to whom he's writing. What it suggests and shows us is that ministry is not meant to be done in isolation. But we serve together in cooperation. I'm deeply troubled by this isolationist mentality that has permeated amongst our churches today. Churches that will make the statement, well, I don't see a need to be a part of a convention or an association. We'll just serve God by ourselves. Just the other day, somebody asked, well, what good is it to be a member of a convention? And the reason that bothered me is because that person had a church that my God in heaven needed some help and needed to kind of be stirred up. And I wanted to ask him, well, what good is it to be a member of your dead church? We've taken on an arrogant attitude, thinking that we can do ministry by ourselves. But the reality is we need to be in cooperation with one another. I grew up as a boy watching shows, uh, westerns on the television. And, and, and one thing I note is that partnerships are always better. I, I grew up watching shows like the Andy Griffith Show. Can I get a witness here? I grew up watching shows like Gunsmoke. I, I grew up watching shows like Batman and Robin. Huh? And now one of the things I note is that that Marsha Dillon was all right. But Gunsmoke ain't quite what it ought to be without Festus. Yeah. 
Andy Griffith was a good shaft. Yeah. Him and ain't be all right, but 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 the Andy Griffith show wasn't what it needed to be without Barney Fife. Ever got a witness here? Yeah, Batman was all right. You remember Batman in the sixties? It, it pow, bang, pop. Batman was all right. Every now and then you need a little robin along the way. I, I like to watch show like like to watch show like the Lone Ranger. Can I get a witness here? Lone Ranger was all right. But you got to have Tonto somewhere in there. That's how it is when it comes to convention work. That's how it is when it comes to association work. That's how it is when it comes to the church. Yeah, you all right by yourself. But ain't it better when we're serving and working together? Yeah, here there's cooperation here. He said, all the saints preach you. What he want to let them know is that you're not out here by yourself. Can I get a witness here? You know ministry can be a lonely road. When you're serving God, it can be a hard and lonesome road when you're out there by yourself. But every now and then you need somebody to come alongside you and let you know you're not by yourself. You don't have to carry the load by yourself. You don't have to endure the pressure by yourself. You don't have to endure the pain by yourself. You've got somebody that'll come alongside and help prop you up when you're leaning and falling down. Can I get a witness here? Yeah, I remember that old prophet Elijah when he was on the run from Jezebel. He said to the Lord as he's down there by the river, he said, Lord, only me out here still holding up your word. God said, man, what you talking about? I got 500 others just like you. Can I tell you, whenever you feel like you're out there by yourself, don't you think you're by yourself? He will never leave you alone. No, never alone. Then there's something else in the text. I've, I've got to hunk this off. I, I thank you for indulging me as sweetly as you have already. But notice here in the text, he said, all the saints salute you. But then he said, chiefly, they that are of Caesar's household. Uh oh. Now, this is where the shout is. He's writing to believers in Philippi. Philippi is a province that is populated by former soldiers of the Roman government. They, they, they know well the, the republic and, and, and the empire now that they are under. And they know that uh, those that are of Caesar's household, uh, uh, it does not mean his family members, but it means those that are in the service of Caesar. They know very well that they have given uh, their, their allegiance and pledged their allegiance to Caesar alone. And for the fact that these Romans have decided to follow Jesus and are now a part of the family of God that Paul uses to greet. What Paul was saying to them, I want you to know that the ministry gift that you gave me has been a blessing and now some others have come into the faith. But watch it. Watch it. Because we've got to wonder. How did those of Caesar's household get in to the faith? What Paul was showing them was it doesn't matter where you are. You can spread the gospel no matter where you are. Paul is in prison. He's not in a pulpit. Paul is in a dungeon. He is not in a, a, a palatial church. But Paul says no matter where I am, I can still tell a dying world that he's a living savior. My sanctified imagination, I believe while those soldiers were, were there with Paul guarding him and watching him, they, one of them walked up to him and said, Mr. Paul, you don't look so bad, Mr. Paul. How did you get in here? Mr. Paul, we've got murderers in here. Mr. Paul, we've got thieves and robbers in here. M Mr. Paul, we, we've, got, we've got traitors. In here. Mr. Paul, what did you do exactly in order to get in here? Paul said, well... Now, I need you to know something. I used to be a pretty bad fella. I used to be a member of a council of people that had me in religious leadership. And, and I used to go and persecute the church of God. I used to go and as a matter of fact, I, I would put people in jail if they would call on the name Jesus. 
I used to at one point uh, uh, watch while people were beaten for the gospel's sake. I used to, as a matter of fact, be so bad that I would just wink my eye or just wave my hand and men would go and stone others to death. As a matter of fact, there's a record that says I was complicit unto the death of a deacon one day. I held the coats of the men that went and stoned Stephen to death. I used to be a pretty bad man. Well, well, Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, wait a minute, Mr. Paul. You say you used to? Yeah, yeah, yeah I used to. Well, Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, what happened that changed you? Paul said, oh, I, I, I don't know, but I, I, let me just explain it to you like this. One day when I was on my way, y'all going to pray here, aren't you? In order to persecute the church of God. There came a light from glory that shined brighter than the noonday sun and knocked me to the ground. And all I know is I was born as one out of due season. As soon as I looked up and saw Jesus, I said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And my Easter is now my Easter. But let me tell you what I do now. The same people I used to put in jail are the same ones I'm encouraging now. The same ones I used to have beaten are the same ones I'm taking stripes for now. The same ones that I used to stop are the same ones I'm starting, I'm trying to start now. That Easter is my past, but I thank God for my present. Can I tell you this? There are some of us in this room, you want to forget about what you used to be and what you used to do, and some of y'all ought to forget it. I know I'm in a Baptist convention. Mr. President, do I have a few more minutes? I know I'm in a Baptist convention, but I know some of us wasn't always at a banquet on a Wednesday night. Some of us might be getting our clothes out for Friday night. Have I got a witness here? Yeah, some of, some of us used to, used, used to party all week long. Yeah, yeah, some, some, of us, some of us wasn't having sweet tea in our cup. It was brown, but it wasn't tea. Wasn't no Lipton in that cup. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, some of us used to keep it in the trunk of the car. We suddenly have to tip out of the banquet and go and get a little taste and come on back in. That's why Dr. White, even to this day, I don't allow red solo cups in my church. I have flashbacks. I used to keep mine in the car. Some of you ladies didn't have on them pretty evening gowns like you got now. You had them short skirts on and you could make them pop. Don't worry about what's in my cup. Don't Listen, I said that one night and the mother of the church said, baby, I can still make it pop. I said, <laughs> Yeah, but there are some of us that your used to is past tense. But thank God that you've got a present that is far different today. There are some of us know where God has brought us from and thank God for where God has brought us from. There are some of us that if, if the record were to be told, God had to bring us not a, a, a short way, but God had to bring us from a mighty, mighty, mighty long way. Somebody might want to know, well, how did it happen? You just have to tell them like the hymn writer said, oh, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart floods of joy oh my soul like sea billows roll since jesus God almighty oh, jesus hey i believe i got it tonight came into my heart 
He said those from Caesar's household. He said I've been spreading the gospel. And some unlikely candidates have come to the faith. But here children of God, let me, let, let me just get to the third point and leave this alone. He said glory to the Savior. Greetings from the saints. But then he said, grace for the saints. He said, the grace of our Lord Jesus. Christ be with you all. Amen. You know what grace is, don't you? God's riches at Christ's expense. You know what grace is, don't you? That's when God gives you what you don't deserve. While he gives mercy that holds back what you do deserve. You know what grace is, don't you? It, it is when God looks past your faults and sees you at your point of need. But listen, 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 let, listen, I, I, I can't be all theological uh, with you all tonight. Let, let me just, just express it the way I know how to express it. You, you know, my grandmama was from Camelton, Florida, up there in the Panhandle, just outside of Graceville. And I'd sit in the kitchen, Edwards, and I'd watch Mama fry fish. But now she would never put naked fish down in hot grease. Because it'll just fall apart. But what Mama would do is she'd put a little flour on it. Roll it in a little cornmeal. And then she'd just ease it down in the grease yeah and that same grease can I get a witness here that used to break that fish apart yeah it wouldn't break it apart because you had put a little coating on either side can I get a witness here well that's all grace is it's when the long puts me in his preservation banner. Yeah, and he coats me on either side. I sometimes am in the heat of life. But oh, I'm glad I've got grace that's covering me on either side. Can I get a witness? It get hot sometimes when I make it through this world. But oh, I'm glad I've got God's grace. Can I get a witness here? Oh, 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 oh. I'm glad tonight that I've got God's grace. Are you going to pray with me? Yeah, I believe we ought to sing what the Mississippi Mass used to sing. Your grace and mercy, it brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. I, I, I want to thank you and praise you too. Your grace and mercy, it brought me through. Is there anybody here? You're glad you got God's grace. Ain't it all right? It's been hot some days, but you got God's grace. You've been lonely some days, but you got God's grace. You've been in the fire, but you got God's grace. You've been through the storm, and you've been through the flood. Oh! His grace has been sufficient in your life. Have I got a witness? I need to encourage you tonight. You may be going back home to hell in your church, but don't worry. God's grace will meet you there in your time of need. Have I got a witness? Somebody walked in here tonight with a bowed down head but grace will raise up a bowed down head ain't it all right somebody walked in tonight with sickness in your body pain in your mind 
hurt and pressing you down but I'm glad that grace will touch your body have I got a witness God's grace it is sufficient for me have I got a witness grace will be all you need grace will bear your burdens grace will give you courage to fight ain't it all right glad are you glad tonight you got it you got it oh yeah down in your heart have i got a witness i'm dead I've got God's grace, ain't he all right? Well, let me tell you what grace will do. A few years ago, my mama got sick and I had to start taking her to the doctor. And we went from doctor to doctor and nobody could help my mama. But one day when I was riding to pick her up, I said, no, no, my mother is sick and nobody knows what to do. But I need you, Lord, to meet us at the doctor's office. And I'm here to report that was two years ago. And she's better now than ever before. Grace met us there. Ain't it all right? Well, let me cut across the field and leave you all alone. And let me tell you what grace did. Grace, let them whip him all night long. Grace, let them put a crown of thorns on his head. Grace, let them march him from hall to hall. Grace, let them lay him down and stretched out wide. Grace, let them put nails in his hand and nails in his feet. Grace, let them lift him high. So glad it was not the nails that held him to the cross. But oh! and dying dying and bleeding so glad that he died surely he died Matthew said he died surely he died Mark said he died surely he died Luke said he died surely he died John said he died surely he died but I'm so glad that died wasn't all if he had stayed dead I'd be in trouble tonight if he had stayed dead you'd be in trouble tonight but he stayed in a grave all night Friday all night Saturday all Saturday night but y'all know what he did are y'all gonna help me are y'all gonna help me I thank y'all for being so kind I thank y'all for making sure that Jesus died but I don't have to die tonight but can you help me finish it out do y'all know what he did right on has introduced 
himself by introducing us to the Lord Almighty in a fresh new way. Thank God for Dr. Adrian Taylor. May he live a long time, Dr. Preston, to preach the gospel. Now, earlier today, after the word went forth with power like this, on the, the anointing of the almighty God, moderator, Palem got up talking about one word. That's all he could think about was one word. But I've got not one word, I've got one question. After hearing a message like this, and my question simply is, who shall believe our report? We want to extend an invitation, even in a banquet. Because even in a banquet, you can get saved. If you're here tonight and do not know the Lord in the parting of your sin, it's a good time. It's a good time to come and receive him. Will there be one? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. What a message. What a message. Amen. We're going to get a selection. We're going to get a selection from our music department. Amen. I'm looking for them. Are they still there? <laughs> selection. A selection. Amen. I, I, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Amen. And then we're going to prepare our hearts to receive a report. Amen. From our young people's department. Amen. From the pennies from heaven. Amen. We have such a um, gracious leader who's all about order. Amen. Amen. And, and I asked him, could we break order and let the young people's department come? And he conceded. Amen. But let me, um, while they're preparing to sing, let me let y'all in on a little vaccine stuff. Vaccine stuff. for president, they're going to come. But tonight after they come and the pennies from heaven is presented, we're going to transition and not do the solidarity report tonight. We're going to instead do what our president has asked us to do, and that is honor 40 years of service. Amen. Amen. From Sister Bobby Scarlett. We will give the solidarity report at a later time. Come. Your grace and mercy drawn me through living this moment because of you. I want to thank you and pray you too. Your grace and mercy brought me through. Listen. Yeah. 
it brought, it brought me to again to everyone. Thank you, President Johnson, for this opportunity. Very quickly, we just want to um, just acknowledge uh, the Young People's Auxiliary Solidarity is raised from the Young People's Department each district yearly during the annual session and during the winter board. And that is through the pennies from heaven donations that are done. And this is inclusive of all 25 of our districts. These donations that are given are based uh, with the same category of the red, white, and blue, dependent upon the number of churches that are in the districts. So tonight, very quickly, we would like to celebrate these districts. Um, this is the award that we give yearly with the third, second, and first place, amen, for your giving. Uh, this is something that is done, and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. The categories again being red, white, and blue. We're going to start with our third place. In the blue category, we congratulate and thank Gateway. So a representative from Gateway, you can please come forward and receive your trophy. For the white category, the third place, Mount Zion Northeast, come forward. For the third place, red category. Okay, Jerusalem, come forward. And we did this year have some changes in the um, districts where they fell in the red, white, and blue. Yes, for Gateway. Amen. For our second place, in the blue category, we congratulate Emmanuel. Amen. 
For the white category, in the second place, we congratulate Union Progressive. And for the red category, second place, First West Florida. Amen. All right, and last, for the first place, amen. For the blue category, we congratulate and thank First Macedonia, amen. And for the first place, white category, Union St. James. Can't hear you. And for the first place in the red category, Seaboard. I bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to, uh, first of all, thank God for our gift to the body of Christ and the personality of Adrian Taylor. What a man. I mean, <laughs> I'm just totally impressed with his heart. He is such a vessel. If you be around him, he's just so smooth. It's like, you know, he's one of the smoothest, intelligent, sincere, saved preachers that I've seen in a long time. I think God just brought him to Florida just to make sure that I stay in line and do the right thing. Amen, somebody. But what a preacher. Let's give God another hand clap of praise for him. Adrian knows my heart, and I want to do this because I think Dr. Holmes is going to say something to continue to bless our body. You heard me stood up here. All my aim and objectives are right. Uh, when it comes down to people want to do what they want to do, I don't tell nobody not to run or to run. I just let God be the judge. That's why I say this, check everything out. But I did what I was supposed to do. Holmes want to say something about this endeavor. I believe in his wisdom. He ran for national spotlight. Holmes, come and uh, bless your convention and give us some ease in Zion. Mr. President, thank you and the chairman of our board and this great preacher, Dr. Wright, and brothers and sisters. Um, let me just want to say this in, in, in the spirit of grace and love. And I hear people talk about how long we've been around in this convention. I came, I, I'm sorry, I, I've been here 48 years. Um, and Dr. Johnson asked why I serve as part of his presidential council. Um, I, I know the pain of when you reach for something and you don't achieve it. Allegedly, people said my 10 years as Congress president nationally was very remarkable and major. When I pursued the presidency, not 10 years ago, but 16 years ago, and for whatever reason, we had the letters, and we didn't get them in on time because we thought we can bring them to the board meeting. My mistake, but Rome was 828. I had a decision to make. Should I go to the inauguration of the first black president elected Barack Obama January 2008, or should I come to the board meeting to do what my good friend and mentor, Dr. Shaw said, come and ask for grace. I said, Mr. President, I need to be in Washington, but if you need me to come and ask for grace, to ask the board to allow me to run, I do it. We met, and, and Dr. Sampson, you were with me. You were in the room. And they said, Holmes, we love you. But the Constitution says, this is when it's supposed to be in, and it didn't come in on time. 
And I ask you to come and ask for grace and see what the board going to say. They took a vote, then bring it to the floor in the room. It was a closed vote, but I didn't prevail. Upset? Oh, yes. Angry? Oh, yes. Mad? No. Went home, prayed about it. Some folks said, Reverend, you ought to file a lawsuit. I said, no, that ain't me. God has blessed me too much to get involved in that. My good friends, Samson, others said, Reverend, you got to fight. Keep fighting. I said, no, doc, that door has closed. I need to go back home. I've been away 10 years as president of the National Baptist Conference Education. Maybe God closed that door for me to go back home and pastor the Bethel Church and seeking to have a convention and a congress every Sunday morning and Wednesday night. We need, if the Constitution said what it said, and then we come back 16 years later and violate what is a constitution? If anybody ought to raise hell, ought to be me. <laughs> but I'm not a hell raiser. I've come too far. God been too good to us to fight over a title when I got a testimony. Brethren, when the, thank you, Ted, I told him to come back. When the brethren was speaking, I either says, Holmes wanted to speak. I said, no, not, not right now. We're not, we're not doing that now. There's a time for everything. And Holmes and about five other men, I asked to be my senior counsel. I trust his judgment. Whatever that meant, what he just did, take heed to it. Because he spoke from truth and conviction. But once again, God we trust everything else we got to check out with the facts don't move based on somebody promising you positions they come and go Roscoe Jackson told me I'm going to be moderator don't get too happy it's only for a tenure do a good job in that time yeah. these positions don't last but while you in it do a good job and treat people right and so we got good people in our convention but Florida People are really looking at you because they need you to help do what needs to be done when it comes to right. Keep praying, and we will continue to communicate to you about this unforeseen circumstance that never been done before. Thank you, Dr. Holmes, for sharing that passion. And by the way, he said this is being recorded all across the country. He was telling me, but President, you realize that while these speeches was going on, folks was texting and da 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 da. I mean, that, that's bad, but folk got to start spreading something negative when we're trying to do something positive. So we just got to do the right thing, Florida General Baptist. Now, guess what? All that's going to be over after tomorrow night when I do my address. <laughs> Y'all caught you. When I finish doing what I got to do and sit down, oh, we're going to go back and enjoy the Lord again, and we're going to close out this guy will work on Friday from the north end. To God be the glory. Now, I believe that's it. I believe that's it, Larry. Is that it? Because I think we had, oh, no, no, that's not it. That is not it. This service is designed to honor Bobby Scarlett. Give me good, y'all. Dr. Larry is my executive director. Isaac works with me when it comes to my right-hand man. And Dr. Edwards does the work when it comes to general secretary business, which means running the convention this week. Larry got word to me that Bobby wanted to resign. I went to the headquarters and I met with her and she was very passionate about why she wanted to retire, excuse me, I won't say resign, retire. And we said, okay, you wanna retire? And I listened to her carefully. I said, well, guess what? The proceeds from this banker, we gonna give you the proceeds from this banker. Cause you're not going out any kind of way and I'm the president. 
you going out in style. And she already got a nice car. I can't get another car, y'all. Amen to my <laughs> But I want the Sister Edwards and President White to come do what I've asked you to do to honor Bobby tonight. And I want y'all to please give Bobby right now before they come a great big standing ovation for all the work she's done these many, many years. Come on. We can do better than that. Grace and greetings to our presider, to our president, and his queenly wife, and to my sister who stands next to me, our president, and to the chairman. I begin with these words. If you haven't stood on another's shoulders or someone hasn't stood on yours, you're not building a legacy. In March, in the late 1940s, I won't tell you the year, one of the Florida General Baptist Convention's beloved servant leaders was born, but Florida General didn't know it yet. This individual was never president, but regulated the heartbeat of the organization for 40 years of its existence. This individual did not set out to be a servant leader to Florida General, but was chosen to stand on someone's shoulders. Those who came before her saw something in her that they knew would be needed, but needed to be nurtured for the right harvest. What does it mean to stand on someone's shoulders? It's paying attention to the words and the actions of others that you don't think you will ever use. It's knowing that you have a responsibility to love people who may not love you back. It's saying, and it's not saying everything that you know. It's taking the low road and knowing when the timing is pivotal. I'm not just talking about any servant leader, but tonight we are taking these moments in time to speak the words of gratitude and honor to Mrs. Bobby J. Scarlett. <laughs> All right, as Miss Carter is coming up at this time, we would like Bobby, Bobby, come on down, Bobby. You know, I think back 40 years ago, Bobby and I have gone through three or four presidents. We started out with Celestine Dixon. That's been 40 years ago. So now, Miss Carter is coming at this time, and we would like her to just share some things that happened with Azora Simmons, Andell Mickens, and all of those back at that time. So, Miss Carter, if you would come at this time and just share with us. Actually, Bob. Good evening, Florida General. Good evening. This is a pleasure for me. Everybody say with me, Bobby Ann. Bobby Ann. Bring some wood from that wood pile. Bring some wood from that wood pile. I'm going to take you back briefly to Dun Ellen. I'm not going to say everything that I have here. Uh, we're going to do a part two of this at the house party and continue telling more, but I'm going to give you just enough to embarrass her tonight. <laughs> Dun Ellen, Florida, part of Marion County, and you know Oak Hill and Marion County, we're very prideful. We think the best comes out of Oak Hill and Marion County. But Bobby Ann came from an area, we call it Cross the River. And I couldn't think of the name of the little community. Chatmire, Chat I don't know how I forgot Chatmire. Can't find it on the map anyway. But growing up there with the grandmother, and just a house full of children, and it was a bunch of them, but they all managed somehow. I've heard her talk about it and was at one of the family reunions and parties and heard them talk about how many people could live in the one house and everybody had somewhere to sleep and everybody had something to eat. But out of that environment, she was nurtured and raised 
to be a perfectionist. Now, uh, I saw uh, Brother uh, Billy Hawkins, and I know the current finance team, you all know Bobby is a perfectionist. It has to be right. All the paper got crooked. The line's not straight. The border is this. One of my first encounters, I've known her a long time, but for one of the first times I knew she was really crazy, <laughs> they kept me up at a convention for six cents, six <laughs> pennies. When one o'clock came, I took my purse and dumped it on the bed and found six cents. I said, if you let me go to bed, she, uh, Ira Jones was there, uh, 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 some of the others, uh, Madeline Sermons and some of those, uh, they, and Clayton and all of them. I said, if I give y'all six cents, will y'all let me go to bed? All I want to know, what came in? Where did we budget it to go? Did you pay and give to the ministers that we said we were going to give it to? Let me go to bed, because now it's approaching to, oh, no. I knew then, but I can't say Florida General without saying some names in the history, and we'll do more of that at House Party. But I can't say Florida General Bobby Scarlett without saying Alzora Simmons, who was worse than Bobby. Bobby came up as a, a high school student in what I learned from Reverend Joyce Wright was Dillard Comprehensive School, high school. I had said Dillard High School, but Dillard High School didn't exist. So that's why it's so important to know your history, write your history, tell your history, share your history. It was still at any comprehensive high school equipped students to come out of high school with a diploma as well as a certificate in some kind of uh, area that prepared them for the workforce. Remember, we're looking at a time when many of us, of our families were dealing with first generational high school graduates. Many of them College was probably not in their foreseeable future, but in Bobby's case, it was business and bookkeeping. We couldn't put accountant with women at that time. That's another story. But to come out and being trained under Miss Simmons, and when you think of Miss Simmons, it had to be to the dot. So she can't help it. When she was giving you all trouble in that office, she can't help it. And other names in the history, and I'll go into that more at House Party, Sister Rice and all of the presidents that Bobby worked under in different capacities for 40 years. Susan C. Holly is a name that we'll have to talk more about. Was not the longest serving president, but she was one that goes down in terms of effectiveness and things that got done under Sister Holly, that the women were able to build and pay for a building selling candy. They called it the candy house. And in the days of segregation that we heard a little bit about, when ministers came to preach a minister in the area, if they weren't able to stay in someone's home as a guest, it was equipped with a little living space, similar to what you had at that place, Bentley, where you took us, that ministers could come in, similar to that. And they could stay there, and the women would bring them food, and they would have accommodations that they could go and preach about. But that's the kind of leadership that Bobby was nurtured under. Sarah Rice is another name that we learned a lot about smart woman, cunning woman. In the years I was working at Florida Memorial, she put me on the house party committee. But little did I know, not that she thought I knew anything, 
but I could take care of all the business that she needed taken care of at Florida Memorial. <laughs> women of wisdom, women of knowledge. So what we see here is a product. Celestine Dixon, Pensacola, a product of working and learning and being under those women for 40 years. Bobby, we salute you tonight. All of my family, I got the family flower on, and I know she'll introduce them when she makes her remark, but all of my family stand up. I made an acquaintance from Bellevue St. Off School over there that with that back went to school with you all stand up and wave your hand, and I know Bobby will acknowledge you. Enjoy your retirement time, Bobby. It's good to wake up and look out. <laughs> Close the curtains back up and go back to sleep until you get ready to get up. We salute you tonight. Part two of the story of Bobby Scarlett will come at the house party. Thank you, Madam President, for entrusting me to follow your vision and the memories that you ticked in my mind when you told me what was in your mind. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Mr. President, if you would allow us just three more minutes. Uh, there are some women, uh, well, could be men too, that would like to make a special presentation to Bobby. So at this time, all of the women of Florida, if you would just get up very quickly, come on quickly and come right here, quickly. It doesn't matter where you are, just come quickly. And we'll start from this side. Now, we won't be allowed to talk. We'll do that part two at the house party. Part two. So Bobby just wants to see you. I think you ought to, we ought to take Bobby down. Okay. Yes. Yes, that's right. Now, while they're making preparation, my wife have something you want to share with Bobby as well? You gave it to her? But, but say it publicly. Let people hear you say something. Yeah, let him hear Esther. Bobby, she's something. Say something, Bobby. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. You all look so beautiful. Um, Bobby, I just want to say, where she went? <laughs> I need glasses. You look so beautiful. And I wish you the best. And uh, congratulations and thank you for just being a blessing to the kingdom of God to God's people. And we're going to hear from Dr. Preston after this last presentation. So go ahead on, ladies. Fill the basket up to her cup run it over. It's in your hands now, ladies. After this not your night, let, brother, let Bobby get her blessings. This is beautiful. Dr. Bland, can you pass this microphone to Dr. Strange? and let Dr. Strange give it to Dr. Preston. Please listen up, good people. Beautiful Mother White, beautiful President White. They got Quentin Woods in that line. Oh, she worked with you from the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee is looking after Bobby. That's good, Quentin. Bobby, you see that Finance Committee leader there? They looking after your daughter. All right. Bobby, after President Preston speaks, we're gonna let you say a word. But I want Dr. I want Dr. Preston to speak at this time. You're gonna speak, so stay right there for me, daughter. Dr. Preston is in your hand. Greet us tonight, my brother. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, thank you for this this spot uh, <laughs> to express my love and appreciation to 
uh, Sister Scarlett. Um, Dr. Taylor Listen. spoke tonight about Andy Griffith. <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> and one day Andy Griffith graduated to a uh, Matlock. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You got it? And one day, Matlock got so interesting. And they, at the end of the show, they had a caption at the bottom that said, to be continued. So Dr. Scarlett, your work at the convention is not over. It just will be con continued. And I want to thank you for the work that you did while I was president. Unforgettable, impeccable, and appreciated. And keep up the good work. It's well appreciated by Florida General Baptist Convention. And I want to commend Sister White President Johnson, for remembering you tonight. Amen. And remember, good deeds are never lost. God bless you. May God keep you. Wow. My beloved brother, Dr. Lance, where's my gavel? I need to close the convention right now to that segment. <laughs> Bobby, I got it. Right. Yeah. Bobby, share your heart. Give me the microphone. Uh. Good evening and thank you. I, ha I have it written down, uh, my remarks to the presider, to President Car Carl Johnson, to all auxiliary leaders, each delegate of this August body. To my family, my family. Oh, what a beautiful family. Portion of my family. Sisters, brother-in-laws, nieces, and nephews. Amen. My children, my siblings, my in-laws, my beloved groom, Deacon Carlton Scarlett, who unfortunately is not able to be here. Yes, ma'am. But first, I want to give glory and honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom I live, move, and have my being. Thanking him for blessing me with this awesome journey of life with the Florida General Baptist Convention. He has blessed me to serve this convention for 40 glorious years, and for this, I am grateful. Thank you, President Johnson and Dr. White, for granting me this privilege to retire with dignity and respect yes. from the labor of love that was afforded me by the master. My father. Thank you, Florida General, for allowing me to serve you to the best of my ability with the gifts and talents given to me by God from the foundation of the world. One of my favorite scriptures is taken from Jeremiah 29, 11, which says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And so I encourage each of you to grab a hold of this word and accept the fact that the master planner already knows what he has planned for each of us. It will be easy to follow him or stay on the path that he has placed you. It, it may not be. But at the end of the day, you will do well and experience great success if you stay where he places you. President Johnson is the eighth president under which I have served. And President White is the sixth woman president under which I have served. Let me share with you some things that helped me as I labored during the past 40 years. Dr. J.C.Y. said, if you're a leader, and no one is following you, you're not leading, you're just taking a walk. <laughs> Excuse me, hold this one. Yes. 
I'm sorry. Take my time. Okay. Forty I years. I thought I would have the forty in the high behind as I change my time. Take your time. Dr. Sarah Rice told me to never move myself where, from where God has planted me. She told me to stay no matter how hard it gets, and that's what I've done, because you don't know where he is going to take you. So stay steadfast and grow where you've been planted. And I say that to each of you, especially leaders, because it's not easy to lead, I'm going to say this, colored Christians. <laughs> Sister Al Zora Simmons, my retired high school teacher from Dillard, a mentor for me as the, as the headquarters office manager said to me when training me to replace her, I don't say everything I know. Now this is, this is, is she kept telling me that, but eventually I got it. So to all of you in leadership, keep this in mind. If you're going to serve and protect the leader under whom you serve, you can't say everything you know. Amen. And lastly, my godmother, Sister Gloria Register of Mount Nebo, Fort Lauderdale, said to me, Bobby, there will come a time in your life when your mission work will be at your home. So don't leave home to go to a mission meeting and do mission somewhere else when you're needed at home. Currently, Florida General, in my life, my work, mission work is at my house in the person of my 95-year-old husband who needs me daily. Therefore, I am retiring after 40 years. Next to my daughter, son, and two granddaughters, this has been one of the greatest accomplishments of my life. And I am eternally grateful to God, the master planner, for allowing me to serve him by growing where he planted me to say, serve his people of the Florida General Baptist Convention. May all I have done is doing and will continue to do glorify God. Now one of these days, my life will be celebrated with this old hymn of the church. Servant of God, well done. Rest from thy loved employ. The battle is fought, the victory is won. Enter the master's joy. The voice at midnight came. She started up to hear, a mortal error will pierce my heart. My frame, she fell, and I'll fall, but I'll have no fear. Until then, I will keep on working, keep on believing, and I will keep on serving in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Y'all give her a standing ovation. Yes, let's give Bobby a big round of applause. Bobby, we want you to know that this is only part one. Part two will be at the house party. And ladies of Florida, you will have an opportunity to show her more love at that time. Thank you. Believe it or not, Bobby will still be working in the convention. Yes, you will. In the, yeah, I heard you will be. Yeah. Okay, at this time, we're going to have uh, words of thanks from Dr. Lovett, words of observation and appreciation from Dr. Adrian Taylor, and then the closing prayer by Dr. Cavalis Thomas. There is a service tonight uh, to my right. There's a building where the uh, women meet. It's called Late Night Service Tonight. You're so welcome to come and, and enjoy that service. Uh, Dr. Jackson and the moderator's division, Bobby Scarber, talked about getting a well done. You definitely will get your well done because you've done well. God bless you. God keep you. my prayer. Our beloved words of thanks. The hour is far spent. And so the words of thanks, we just want to say thank you. Thank you all so much for your kindness and praying with us tonight. It was a joy to be able to speak and share with you. Mr. President, did I do all right? You did all right. I'm ready for payment. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. He fooled me, didn't he, y'all? He said, you got to pay me down. I said, you the man. 
Now he changed his mind since he did so good, y'all. I'm going to give him an increase he did so well tonight. It's been a wonderful night, hasn't it? All right, let's all stand. And Adrian Teller is somebody's preacher. Don't you ever forget that. Tell me, Dr. Cavallis, lead us out in prayer. You are such a holy man of God. Take your break, and let's go to late night uh, to enjoy this. Mr. Chairman, all is well. Anything we need to say? Chairman Jackson? Yes, sir. We, okay, sir. Shall we pray? God, our Father, we thank you for Jesus' joy. We thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, what our hearts have received. Now, God, continue to bless us only you can. As we leave this place, Father, I pray that you will be with us as we celebrate the victory in Jesus' name. To God be the glory. We thank you. We love you. It is in Christ's name we pray. And the people said, amen.